This is Lecture 3 of Math 217. I want to begin the lecture with a little bit of an anecdote. The anecdote is from 1936. This is what you're seeing is the Literary Digest, one of the very popular magazines of the time. In 1936, the Literary Digest sent out by mail a poll to 10 million voters. They got back mailed responses from 2.4 million voters, which uh, was a pretty large percentage of all of the voters in the national election coming up. And on the basis of their responses, they predicted that Landon would beat Roosevelt in a landslide. Of course, you can probably already see a problem with this, namely that you have never heard of President Landon. In fact, Roosevelt won by one of the biggest landslides in history. They could not have been more wrong. At the same time, a young pollster by the name of Gallup predicted the result to within 1% of the final vote tally, and he used a comparatively tiny poll of only 50,000, although that's vastly more than polls are, that are used today. So our lecture on sampling design is addressing, in part, what they did wrong and what he did right, and in general, how to design your samples. Uh, I'll remind you that a sample is a subset of the population about which you gather data. In particular, it's generally meant to be representative of the population as a whole. We're going to address how you accomplish this and what happens when it's not true. So we're going to be dis discussing sampling design or sampling procedure, which is the method for choosing the sample. I have to admit to some unfortunate terminology in practice when people are talking about the sampling design, they often say just the sample, which makes it very confusing. I will try not to do that, uh, but you may see that in real life. There are two baseline things that you expect from the sampling procedure, and here I am going to overlap the notion of the sampling procedure and a description of the sampling procedure. So. Your sampling procedure should be repeatable. That is, it should be clear from your description how I could go off and take another sample by the same procedure. I might have different individuals, but the process should be the same. And it should be not haphazard. That is, I should be able to tell from the description, or at least figure out, um, what the chance of any particular individual being chosen for the sample is. And I want to emphasize that this is a practical question for those of you taking Math 217 because your end of semester group projects will all involve doing some sampling. So you will need to design a sampling procedure. You'll need to describe it in your final report. Here's somewhat paraphrased some, some of the descriptions that I have seen. Uh, the first one, the, the, the group asked some people on Facebook, and then some guys came in their dorm room, so they asked them. Uh, this is not repeatable and is haphazard. It's not repeatable because I have no idea from that description how I would do the same thing. And it's haphazard because I have no idea from that description which individuals would be more likely to be chosen by such a procedure than which other individuals. <clears throat> Second example is a bit better quite a bit better. I went to the library and I stopped the first 50 people at the exit. This is certainly repeatable. How would I repeat this? I'd go to the library and I'd stop the first 50 people at the exit. It isn't quite, it is still a little bit haphazard, I should say. Um, I don't know exactly when they went to the library. It sort of matters, since the kind of people you'll meet depend on what time of day you're doing it. Uh, and there is some issue about when a bunch of people are leaving the library, are you actually stopping all of them? Do all of them answer you? All of those are questions that you really need to understand to be able to address who is more and less likely to be chosen in the survey. Here's a third example. I assigned everyone in the population a number. I had my computer pick 50 random numbers, and I asked those people. So you can see... I know exactly how to do that procedure, no problem. 
and it's not at all haphazard. I know exactly what each individual's chance of being in the survey is. They all have the same chance of being in the survey, I guess 50 over the size of the population. The first two examples, especially the first one, are considered convenience sampling, which is sampling the most easily accessible individuals. Uh, convenient sampling is generally not representative. That's its problem. It can favor some individuals over others. The best option is kind of counterintuitive. The best option in terms of being representative is a random sample. A random sample, which really means a random sampling procedure, is a procedure in which each individual in the population has some chance, has the same chance, I'm sorry, of being chosen. Because it's random, that doesn't guarantee that it's representative. If you're looking at people's height, you might happen to pick all tall people, or you might happen to pick all short people. So it doesn't guarantee anything. But in the long run, if you repeat that sample, the ones with overly tall people will happen just as often as the ones with overly short people, and on average, it will be representative. <clears throat> so random sampling is the gold standard of sampling. There are several kinds of samples within random sampling. We will focus almost exclusively on the first, which is important to recognize. The other two are important to be, important to be aware of, but we will not focus on. The first one is called a simple random sample. We'll talk about it so much that we'll usually just call it an SRS. You should recognize that initials. In a simple random sample, not only is each individual equally likely to be chosen, but any two individuals are as likely to be chosen together in the same sample as any two other individuals. That's kind of complicated, and it won't make sense without an example. Let me do an example. I'm going to use one setup for all my examples. I want you to imagine some big state university with a very large dorm, which in particular has lots of floors. So in that case, simple random sample would involve taking, writing down, say, the name of everybody who lives there, putting a number, numbering them in order, and then using a computer or a random number generator to randomly select 200 individuals and go and ask them the questions. A uh, simple random sample tends to be labor-intensive. Uh, in particular, if you have a really big population like all of America, you can imagine, first of all, writing down everybody's name and picking 200 at random would be awfully difficult. Um, second of all, once you've done that, you now have to go hunt down 200 people across the entire country. Uh, that's a little bit impractical. One thing you can do to make your life a little bit easier is a cluster sample. Um, you'll break your population into groups, usually based on some sort of geometric, geographic criteria, sorry, some sort of geog geographic criteria of who's close to each other, and then you're going to pick a simple random sample of those groups, and you're going to sample everything in the group. Well, what would I do in the dorm, I might randomly select four floors and sample everyone on those four floors. That way I'm not going up and down the stairs all the time. So a cluster sample saves effort, travel time. Stratified sample is kind of the opposite. Again, you break the population up into groups, but now you take a small simple random sample from each of those groups. This is usually done so as to maintain balance. If the population divides naturally into groups and you want to make sure that you get the right number in each group, you'll do a stratified sample. So for example, I might decide it's really important that I get as many men as women, so I'd take a sample of 100 men and 100 women. It doesn't generally save me any effort. In fact, it's probably more effort, but it guarantees that I will be balanced in that regard. So which is best? Well, the answer is random sampling is good and non-random sampling is bad. That's completely straightforward. Among the kinds of random sampling, the differences are pretty subtle. The simple random sample uses easier math 
um, and it doesn't require quite as large samples. For the rest of the semester, because it uses easier math, we will focus on simple random samples, and uh, we won't do any other kind. Uh, in practice, usually people are doing more complicated than what I described. Often they are cluster samples within stratified samples. Um, the math is more complicated. They need a little bit larger samples, but it tends to be a little more practical. Uh, when, if you go off and build surveys, you will have to learn that additional math, but that's not really very hard. <clears throat> so, the short story is, we'll always focus on simple random sampling, but any kind of random sampling is better than any kind of non-random. But what's wrong with non-random sampling? Uh, random sampling introduces random error. Sometimes you'll take a sample and get really tall people, sometimes you'll take a sample and get really short people, but those are equally likely to happen. You're as likely to overestimate as underestimate something, and in the long run, on average, it will be representative. That means in particular you can calculate what the probable error is exactly. You can't do that with non-random sampling because it introduces bias. In general, bias means something that shifts a result in a particular direction, favors one direction over the other. Uh, if you're shooting an arrow at a target, sometimes you go to the left of the target, sometimes you go to the right, that's random error. If 90% of the time you're shooting to the left, then that's a bias. Specifically, sampling bias is the situation where there's a group of individuals who are more or less likely to be chosen by your sampling process, and that group differs in a specific direction for a specific parameter from the general population. Let's see what that looks like in an example. So let's say you want to sample Fairfield U students and find out how often they skip class. So the parameter that you're interested in is the average number of classes skipped per week for all Fairfield U students. You're going to look at the average for your sample and hope it's representative. So here are some different sampling methods. You could stop students outside the library. What would be a sampling bias? Well, let's talk this one through. I need to identify a group of individuals more likely to be chosen by that sampling process. In other words, a group of individuals more likely to be found outside the library. It's pretty easy to imagine what type of students are more often found outside the library. And then I have to think about how those individuals would behave as far as skipping classes. Are they more likely or less likely to skip classes? With that in mind, I think it's pretty clear that sampling outside the library favors studious students, and studious students, serious about their studies and interested in learning, probably skip class less often. Okay, So that is an argument for a sampling bias. I identify a group of individuals, studious students, I argue that they're favored by this sampling procedure, and I identify a parameter the average number of classes skipped, and a direction in which they will be shifted. Here's another one. Suppose I ask students in dorms on Thursday evening, why don't you pause the lecture and see if you can identify a uh, sampling bias. And remember, that means identify a group of individuals, say whether they would be more or less likely to be picked, and say whether they will have more frequent class skippings or less frequent? Okay, so I would say that people who are in their dorms on Thursday evening are not out partying on a reasonably popular partying night. So again, they are probably more studious, more serious, they drink less, they probably skip class less often. Notice, you could have argued, perhaps if Fairfield U were a different sort of school, that the people who aren't in their dorms on Thursday night are at the library studying, in which case you'd be making an argument that the people in their dorms are less studious and more likely to skip classes. That would be a totally fine answer. I am not going to second-guess your reasoning about uh, 
who, uh, whether the group is more or less likely to be picked, or whether it will shift the parameter, unless it's completely absurd. But it is important that you are able to come up with some argument for a direction in terms of more or less likely to be picked, a parameter, and a direction that's going to shift the parameter. Okay, one more. Suppose we ask students at the dining hall at breakfast time. Again, well, let's pause, think it through, and then start this up again. I would, say, I would say that this is favoring people who get up for breakfast, since the most common reason to skip classes is sleeping in. These are people who are probably morning people who are less likely to skip classes. Again, you could argue the opposite. You could argue that the people who are skipping classes are doing so so they can go get breakfast, and then in which case the uh, dining hall would be the place to find the class skippers. Which one is true? That's a question, an empirical question we can address if we want to. What I really want you to be able to do, and I'm going to test you on, is the ability, given a situation, to identify possible sources of sampling bias and argue for them. Once you can do that, it's easy to get the hang of deciding which ones are worth worrying about and which ones aren't. Okay, really important that you understand sampling bias, really important that you can think up plausible possibilities for sampling bias. Uh, much, much less important is knowing the names of some special cases of sampling bias. I'm going to go over them. Again, the names are not a huge deal, but they're helpful to talk about. Non-response bias is sampling bias that comes because of individuals who cannot or choose not to participate. Uh, Non-response in itself is not a bias. Right? To be a bias, you would have to be able to argue how those who do not respond differ in some direction on a parameter. However, a high non-response rate is considered a really serious danger sign. It's generally highly plausible that it's going to introduce some sort of bias. Uh, what's an example of non-response bias? Well, you know, lots of surveys are done by telephone. So when you call a number up, first of all, there are people who don't have phones who are not available at all. It's not clear whether you consider that non-response, but certainly lots of people won't answer the phone because they're not there or because they don't want to answer, often because they know that you're a pollster from their caller ID. Uh, and if people do answer, there's a quite a good chance they will refuse to take the survey. How might that bias the results? People who don't answer the phone are probably busier, spend less of their time at home. So you're going to favor unemployed and retired people. You're going to, uh, you're going to not favor type A personalities who are always, bu always busy doing things. People who don't answer or refuse to take the survey are grumpier, more suspicious of strangers, less friendly. You, you, the list goes on. You can probably, in any particular situation, come up with a direction and a parameter in which this will shift. But it is a serious problem. Telephone surveys have a very low response rate, and there are things you can do to try and minimize the effect of that, but there isn't a whole lot. Self-selection bias is just really an extreme of non-response bias. Uh, if a survey is set up so that it requires active and energetic steps to participate in the survey, it's considered a volunteer survey and self-selected, and then the non-response rate is so extreme that typically that means the survey tells you nothing at all. Good examples are you go to websites and there are these web polls, which you can vote on something. Mostly they are advertising gimmicks, but the results of those polls tell you nothing about what people actually think, because only the people who feel passionate enough to respond respond. Uh, an example you may be familiar with is the website Rate My Professor. You can go on there and enter your university, find your professor, and evaluate them both numerically and in words. You can also, of course, go on there and see what potential professors you might take look like. 
and you have probably noticed if you've gone on there that all professors are either the best professor ever or the worst. Lots of times, successive reviews describe the professor both ways, and there's very little in between. Why is that? Because it's a fair amount of effort to go and find your professor, to go and log on, find your professor, and write a response. People only do it if they're feeling really passionate. So generally, they only do it if they loved or hated the professor. Finally, the last one is unconscious sampling bias. Uh, this is one people often misunderstand. It's very narrow. There are lots of situations where the sampling bias has some sort of unconscious feel to it. But unconscious sampling bias only refers to a situation where there's a surveyor who is individually and on the spot picking people. Typically, that means somebody with a clipboard out on the street corner or in a mall or something stopping people. And there's a lot of evidence that when you do that, the people you stop are more attractive, more approachable, perhaps most importantly, more like you. And all of those create the potential for bias. Here's an example. Uh, exit polls, as you may know, are polls of where you stop people as they're coming out of the polling area, out of a place where they vote, and you ask them, who did you vote for? These are obviously much more reliable than a typical poll which asks, who are you planning to vote for? Because you don't know if that person will ultimately vote, you don't know if that person will change their mind, you don't know if that person really is taking the question seriously. Whereas, if you ask somebody, who did you vote for, it seems pretty rare that someone is going to outright lie. So it would seem like exit polls should match the final tally really accurately, but they don't. They tend to slightly favor Democrats. If you tune in election night and you hear what the exit poll is in a given state, and then a little bit later in the night they will tally up the actual votes, Typically, the exit polls will give the Democrats one or two percentage points more than the final tally. Why is that? People don't know. But the best guess is unconscious bias. How might that work? Well, the people who are doing the surveying, that's a pretty low-paying job. They're typically young, not very well off, often they're college students. Who are they going to stop? They're typically going to stop people who are young, not very well off, maybe look like college students, all of which are more likely to be democratic. So most likely this is an unconscious sampling bias. I will leave you to decide for yourself whether Democrats are more attractive than Republicans, and that may be part of it, but we'll move on. We'll return to Landon and his landslide. What was wrong with the Literary Digest survey? A couple of things. First, something I didn't tell you, which is where they got the addresses of people to send these surveys to. It's called your sampling frame. The set of all individuals that have a chance of being in the survey is called the sampling frame. And their sampling frame came from three lists. Their list of all their subscribers, that was an easy one. And then they also went and found lots of automobile and telephone registers in various locations in the country. What's the problem with that? Well, all three of those lists favor wealthy Republicans. Automobiles and telephones in 1936, in the Depression, when they were relatively new technologies, were things owned pretty much by the rich, or at least the upper middle class. Less obviously, the Literary Digest was a magazine that tended to be read by well-off, at least upper middle class uh, people, and not so much by working class people, all of those correlated with being Republican. So this is your classic sampling bias. The sampling procedure was favoring Republicans. A uh, second aspect is there was a 24% response rate, right? 2.4 million versus 10 million. Uh, so that means that three out of every four people didn't return that survey. That is so extreme that you could consider it a volunteer survey, um, and it's safe to say that only the people who felt most passionately responded, so presumably in this election, the Landon fans were the most passionate, 
and were the ones who filled up the mailboxes of the Literary Digest. So this is a classic non-response bias. So that is an example where random sampling, even a relatively small random sample, did an excellent job and non-random sampling failed utterly. Okay, what should you take away from this lecture? First of all, you should be able to define what repeatable and haphazard sampling procedures are. You should know what a random sample is, know what a simple random sample, or SRS, is, and know what sampling bias is. You should be able to describe a sampling procedure and should be able to discuss whether a description of one is repeatable and not haphazard. You should recognize random and non-random sampling and recognize a simple random sample. Finally, once we've worked on this for a bit, you should be able, given a description of a sampling method, to identify likely sources of sampling bias and to argue from the definition that those particular problems are or are not sampling biases. Remember, that means you will need to identify a group of individuals more or less likely to be chosen, a parameter, and a direction in which those individuals are shifted compared to the whole population.